Northrop Grumman has announced a collaboration with Firefly Aerospace to develop an all-American version of its workhorse Antares rocket. The Antares rocket was designed by Orbital Sciences Corporation, now part of Northrop Grumman, to launch the Cygnus cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station. Over the years, there have been several upgrades to the rocket, increasing its capabilities. The current version of the rocket, Antares 230, utilizes a first stage built in Ukraine, which is powered by RD-181 engines supplied by Russia. The supply of engines and the first stage was in question after Russia invaded Ukraine in February. As a solution to unavailable components, Northrop Grumman has now partnered with Firefly Aerospace to develop the engines and first stages for future launches. The new version of Antares, called the Antares 330, will be powered by seven Miranda engines. The engines run on liquid oxygen and rocket-grade kerosene propellants, and they are the same engines Firefly is developing for its beta rocket. The first stage of Antares 330 will use Firefly composites for its structure and tanks. The rocket's upper stage will be similar to what Northrop is currently using on the current version of the Antares rocket. The improved performance of Antares 330 would result in an additional 1,250 kg of cargo that Cygnus could deliver to the ISS, bringing the total to 5,000 kg. Antares 330 will be ready for launch as early as 2024 from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia. According to Northrop Grumman representatives, they have received the first stages and engines for two more Antares 230 launches, one of which is scheduled for October, and the final launch is slated for February 2023. The company has already purchased three Falcon 9 launches for its Cygnus spacecraft to bridge the gap between the last launch of the current Antares and the new version. The inaugural launch of India's small satellite launch vehicle failed to deliver its satellite payloads into their intended orbit due to a sensor issue. On August 7, the 34-meter tall and 2-meter diameter SSLV rocket took off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center for its first development flight. The rocket is configured with three solid stages, and the satellite insertion into the intended orbit is achieved through a liquid propulsion-based velocity trimming module. The rocket's three solid-fueled stages performed admirably on Sunday, but the velocity trimming module hit a snag. The terminal stage was supposed to burn for 20 seconds, but it only lasted 0.1 seconds, depriving the rocket of the necessary height boost. The rocket was carrying ISRO's 135kg Earth Observation Satellite EOS-02 and an 8kg CubeSat called Asadhi-Sat built by Indian students. Instead of placing the satellites in a circular orbit 356 kilometers above Earth, the rocket placed them in an elliptical orbit ranging from 356 kilometers to 76 kilometers. ISRO officials stated on Twitter that the failure of a logic to identify a sensor failure and take corrective action caused the satellites to be deployed into the wrong orbit. ISRO developed a small satellite launch vehicle with the aim of providing cheaper and more flexible access to space compared to its launch vehicles currently operational. SSLV is capable of placing up to 500 kilograms of payload in a 500-kilometer low-Earth orbit. According to ISRO, the rocket has a quick turnaround time, the ability to accommodate multiple satellites, and launch on-demand feasibility with minimal launch infrastructure requirements. ISRO is optimistic that the problems associated with the recent mission failure will be resolved quickly and that they will be able to launch the SSLV for the next flight very soon. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission has rejected Starlink's application for $885 million in federal subsidies. In December 2020, the FCC tentatively awarded $9.2 billion from the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund to over 300 bidders for the deployment of high-speed broadband internet. The subsidies are intended to act as a financial incentive for broadband providers to extend service to remote and underserved areas of the country. SpaceX's Starlink satellite internet network won $885.5 million in the 2020 auction. But, in a press release on Wednesday, the FCC said that they are rejecting the SpaceX application because Starlink failed to demonstrate that it could deliver the promised service. The FCC chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said that SpaceX's technology has real promise but emphasized that Starlink is still developing. The FCC cited that Starlink speeds have declined between the last quarter of 2021 to the second quarter of 2022, and its upload speeds have fallen well below 20 megabits per second. Notably, the FCC's auction in December 2020 represented the first phase in the $20.4 billion program, meaning SpaceX will probably bid for the remaining funds and subsequent auction rounds. Meanwhile, on August 10, SpaceX successfully launched their latest batch of 52 Starlink satellites into orbit from Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. 
The company has now launched more than 3,000 Starlink satellites into orbit, of which 2,713 are in working condition as of August 11. The next SpaceX Starlink mission will lift off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California as early as August 12. Space launch company Astraspace has decided to cancel its Rocket 3 program after five of its seven flights were unsuccessful. The California-based company will now focus on the next version of its launch system, Rocket 4, a more powerful vehicle with higher reliability, capacity, and production rate. Rocket 4 is part of the company's Launch System 2.0, a mobile launch system requiring fewer people in mission control. The launch system will be able to carry up to 600 kilograms into low Earth orbit at a base price of $5 million. According to Astra, customers who signed contracts for Rocket 3 launches will be re-manifested on future Rocket 4 launches, however, the launch vehicle may not be ready to fly customers until 2024. NASA, one of the Rocket 3 customers, is currently planning to look for alternative ways to launch its Tropics CubeSats. NASA designed six Tropics CubeSats to help the agency track developing tropical storms and hurricanes. Following the loss of the first two satellites in a June 12 launch failure, Astra planned to launch the remaining four satellites on two Rocket 3.3 vehicles. Tropics can achieve its scientific objectives with only four satellites, however, Rocket 4 would be an unsuitable vehicle for the satellites because it is designed to carry up to 600 kilograms into low Earth orbit, whereas each Tropics CubeSat weighs only a few kilograms. Furthermore, Tropics has specific orbit requirements to meet its science objectives, because that orbit is not commonly used by other spacecraft, ride-sharing opportunities are ruled out. As a result, NASA is currently looking into alternative ways to launch the four Earth science CubeSats into orbit. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX conducted multiple Starship 24 and Super Heavy Booster 7 static fire tests at the Starbase launch site, marking a significant milestone in the Starship development program. Let's go over the testing events in chronological order. On August 5th, Super Heavy Booster 7, which had been undergoing repairs and refit work for the past month following the July 11th anomaly, was rolled out to the launch site to resume the test campaign. While Booster 7 was being prepared for lift onto the orbital launch mount, one of the hydraulic accumulators of the rocket stacking and catching arm got burst. SpaceX was lucky that the accident did not occur while lifting the booster with the tower arms. Teams immediately lowered the arms to fix the issue. Due to the damage to the chopsticks, SpaceX employed its giant crawler crane to lift and install the booster on the launch mount. As you can see in this image captured by Starship Gazer, only the outer 20 engines of the booster were installed at the time of lift. Furthermore, the blast and heat protection shields that will protect the Raptors from themselves were not fully installed around the engines. Hours before the rollout of Booster 7, Elon Musk tweeted that SpaceX intends to first test the booster's outer engines before installing the inner 13 engines for testing. This explains why the booster only had the outer engines installed. On Monday, August 8, SpaceX began the test campaign of Booster 7. Starship 24, which has been sitting on the suborbital launch pad B for the past few weeks, was also tested on the same day. On Monday evening, SpaceX conducted two back-to-back -back spin prime tests of Ship 24. For those who don't know, a spin prime test typically involves using high-pressure gas to spin the engine turbines for a few seconds to test the plumbing. These two tests on Monday, which involved all six engines on board, were the ship's sixth and seventh spin prime tests overall. Hours later, teams conducted spin prime tests of Booster 7 on the orbital launch mount. Both the Booster 7 spin prime tests that happened on Monday night involved only an engine of the prototype. The Booster 7 anomaly on July 11 occurred during a similar spin prime test, but that test involved all the engines of the booster. The anomaly later forced SpaceX to choose not to test all the engines simultaneously in the future. A few hours before the recent spin prime test of Booster 7, teams raised the tower arm to prevent damage in the event of an anomaly. The arm was resting at the base of the launch tower during the spin prime test on July 11. The arms experienced jolts during the anomaly, but was unharmed. On Tuesday, August 9, SpaceX began the static fire test campaign of Booster 7 and Ship 24. On Monday evening, at 5.24 p.m. local time, SpaceX engineers ignited a single Raptor engine on Booster 7, while the prototype remained anchored to the orbital launch mount. It was the first ever static fire test of the second-generation Raptor engine at the Starbase. It was also the first time SpaceX used the orbital launch mount to support a static fire test. Three hours later, SpaceX fired up two engines on Ship 24 on suborbital launch pad B. It appears that two of the ship's inner sea-level engines were ignited on Tuesday. 
Thanks to LabPadre for all these awesome multi-angle shots of the test campaign. Two days later, on August 11, Booster 7 conducted a much longer static fire on the orbital launch mount. The single-engine burn, which occurred at 2.48 p.m. local time, lasted for about 20 seconds. This long-duration burn was aimed to test the autogenous pressurization system of the booster. Autogenous pressurization typically involves heating a small amount of propellant until it turns to gas, then it is routed into the liquid propellant tank from which it was obtained. This aids in keeping the liquid propellant inside the tanks at the required pressure for feeding the rocket's engines. When the road was opened a few hours after Thursday's test, two self-propelled modular transporters were moved from the production site to the launch site. At the time of making this video, SpaceX is preparing to remove Booster 7 from the orbital launch mount to move it back to the construction site. Once the booster reaches the construction site, teams will begin installing the center engines into the booster. All 13 Raptor center engines were seen moving into the wide bay on Thursday night and Friday morning. Once those engines are installed, the booster will be rolled out to the launch site to resume static fire tests. The next round of static fire testing, most probably a six-engine Ship 24 test, will begin as early as Monday, August 15. These static fire tests, which are intended to test the plumbing and engines ahead of the orbital test flight, have a great significance in rocket testing. If Booster 7 and Ship 24 pass all the upcoming series of ground tests, including the full-stack cryo-proof and static fire tests, they could be the ones that SpaceX will use for the inaugural orbital test flight. On Wednesday, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission granted SpaceX a license to use ground-based antennas to communicate with Starship during the first orbital flight test. According to the Radio Spectrum license application, SpaceX is targeting a six-month window starting on September 1 for the highly anticipated mission. However, this is not the last legal obstacle that Starship must get past before the test flight. The company still requires an FAA launch license before sending Starship around the world on its ambitious orbital flight. The FAA will only issue the license once SpaceX addresses all the issues raised in the FAA's environmental review report. Construction and assembly of the forthcoming Starship and Super Heavy prototypes continue at the Starbase build site. Teams recently stacked the oxygen tank section of Ship 25 on top of the aft section inside the high bay. The remaining sections of the ship are also ready for stacking. Works on the elements of Ships 26 to 29 are progressing at the production facility. Meanwhile, Booster 8 is fully stacked, and work on Boosters 9 to 11 is in progress. A huge thanks to Brendan Lewis for this illustration. On Monday night at Kennedy Space Center, teams rolled out the sixth section of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower from SpaceX's operations area at Roberts Road to Launch Complex 39A. A crane raised the sixth section of the tower two days later and stacked it atop the fifth section. With the addition of this latest section, the tower now stands at about 112 meters in height. Three more sections are required to complete the 143-meter tall orbital launch tower. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.